Heimbold Chair. Um, we are very grateful to Charles Heimbold and his family for establishing this chair um, in the year 2000. It's inaugurated uh, by um, Seamus Heaney and Peter Fallon, and it has had an honor roll of Irish poets since then. James Murphy, former director of Irish Studies, He's really the man responsible for getting this off the ground um, and for keeping it going and for hiring me. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Jim. Um, I'd also like to thank um, uh, the chair of the English department, Evan Radcliffe, um, the dean of arts, um, Alan Drew and Lisa Sewell, um, who are here as well. We can give them a round. This is also part of the Villanova Literary Festival, um, and we realized, what, last year that we need to join forces and have the Heimbold reading as part of the Literary Festival, and it's been a great success, and we're really happy um, that we're joined. Um, I'm going to introduce a couple, of, uh, a couple of students who will then introduce Mary O'Malley, who is our guest for tonight. Um, I also just want to direct our attention over to Tom O'Malley and Cora Keane, who have been playing wonderful music from the Philadelphia Cayley Group. Can we give them a big round? <laughs> we're going to play a bit more music um, with Mary, just before Mary comes up, um, and they can be found at Plowing the Stars on Sunday nights, among other places, I'm sure. Um, I also uh, want to direct your attention, if you would like to be on the mailing list for the Irish Studies events, there are pieces of paper out there that look like this. Please sign one and you can leave it um, with Susan with selling books. Okay, I'm going to introduce um, Sarah Garland and Rosie McCarthy, who are going to introduce Mary O'Malley. I just want to say one word about Mary O'Malley and her husband Stephen Byerly, who, who is also here with us. Um, Mary is a wonderful person who transforms space into luminous space. Uh, we're very fortunate to have her here as the 2013 Heimbold Chair. Um, she is a sweet person and an amazing poet. Um, so, ladies, do you want to come? And I'm going to turn the mic over to them. Thank you all. Writer in residence from 2001 to 2009. 
Her poetry has been given Hennessy and O'Shaughnessy Awards, and Ms. O'Malley has been a resident in the Cultural Center of Ireland in Paris, Derry, and Belfast, where she worked with musicians in the organization Music for Galway. She's also a world traveler. She lived in Lisbon for eight years and spends time in Paris every year. Mary O'Malley has also been active in environmental education for over 20 years. This passion, is in particular, this passion in particular is reflected in her most recent work, Valparaiso. Valparaiso is a collection inspired by her voyage on the marine research vessel, the Celtic Explorer. After traveling the seas, Ms. O'Malley came back to Ireland with a refreshed and new perspective, which can be seen in Sea Road, No Map, which juxtaposes her life at sea with, the life in, with life in Ireland as depicted on the news screen. Recession Eve depicts the futility of the state to fix its economy following its collapse. The lesson to not eat the apple out of his hand again and spin gold from the serpent's promises both refers to politics and the Irish Catholic tradition. The influence of O'Malley's Irish upbringing is present not only here, but also in, in, in Stress in Ireland, written in response to the Ryan Report and throughout the entire collection. The fall of the Celtic tiger, new discoveries about the Irish church, the struggle to keep the sense of Celtic culture and pride in an anglicized homeland, and even the discovery of an ancient Greek computer are just a few of the many themes explored in this richly layered work. It is evident that Valparaiso is a complex, multi-layered compilation. Each poem reflects a new facet of life in amazingly artistic detail. Please help me welcome Mary O'Malley. Um, good evening, good evening, Magav, the musicians. That was lovely. Shishin uh, and when is this? Is Bradley? Maybe here. Um, that's for the uh, head of the, the 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 chairman of the English department because I discovered he speaks better Portuguese than me. <laughs> Sirius and Carla Stran for Colin McCann. Somewhere near 42nd Street, a girl, copper haired, sings for a hawk eyed man. He tastes in the lark's pillar of sound, honey and turf fires. A tinker's curse runs, rings out. This is the voice of Ireland, of what we were. He approves. Her hair gleams, there is a vow. <clears throat> Later, she skips into the graffiti sprayed subway. At the edge of hearing, a laugh, a man's death cry. A woman's love call are carried out of the tunnel's round mouth, caught in the snatch of a tune. She has no idea these under river walls are shored up with Irish bones, black men's bodies. She thinks all the buskers in New York are down here tonight like cats. She hears them, a keen, a skein of blues. They speed her passage. She hums, picking up the echoes in her river run. In Galway, her stooped hair ripens that summer. At Halloween, there are wine apples. A seed caught in her teeth will keep the cleft between this world and the next open, the all souls chorus a filter for certain songs that rise from a cold source. Brandy and honey notes replace spring water. 
the gift price to sing an octave deeper than sweet, tuned to a buried water course. And that poem is about the singer Dolores Kane, who uh, sang for the great Connemara Shano singer and not a man easily pleased, Joseph Heaney or Joe Heaney, uh, in New York, in fact, and he approved, as well he might. Um, I'm going to read this next one for my students because, um, my literature students specifically, um, because I'm doing place in Irish literature with them. And uh, I've been talking about Singh, John Millington Singh. And this is called, is Peggy Mike, who is one of the characters, her farewell to the playboy. Uh, I taught um, poetry workshops in the Aran Islands for several months. Mm, oh, I can't even remember, about 95, I think, or six, probably. And it was some of the best fun I ever had. Um, I used to get the boat in and out on the nine o'clock boat the following morning, through the winter, and sometimes it was dodgy enough. <clears throat> the strand is white, the tide is out, the last ferry has pulled away from the pier. Below a line of council houses, a red scarf lies on the sand, a wound fading at the edges. This is where the knife stabbed the island again and again and again. A breeze plays softly with skin. A young bull roars out of memory cut. A timber-ended tourniquet clips the absence off neatly. The wind stirs the silk, fingers the scarf, picks it up. It struts across the limestone catwalk. You were looking for one red image, just a streak to relieve the grey. You thought there were only the haws, poison berries, a swish of fuchsia. Here, love, adventure is not play acting. The dark man takes his place by right. When night, night falls, blades flash. Oh, okay, sorry, can you hear at the back? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, a very early poem, but again, I want to read it for my students. I think Laura is here and some members, Brendan, some people from my poetry class, because it's an early poem and I told them I would read an early poem. It's from a younger and possibly a much wiser self. <coughs> There is a place, it's called Veronica. There is a place in Chile where men from Europe go to stare at the most distant stars, high in the mountains of the night. Veronica was tortured for nine days by ordinary men, for nine years, for an infinite universe of time by ordinary men with wives and kin. Her heart stopped three times, but they did not let her die. A doctor came to her aid in a crackling white coat. He prescribed precise doses of pain and measured them with clean hands. Still true to his Protean oath, he checked the pressure of her blood. Veronica became the bricks in her prison wall, impenetrable when they raped her. She became the fist that smashed into her face, and when all that they could do was done, she became the ragged scream. She took the mantle of unspeakable acts when she set her mind to live and raise her child. Years later, she found there were things no mother could become. The fire that consumed her son, his crazed heartbeat, the ditch they dumped him in. So she became the hands that soothed his dying feet. Veronica cannot turn the page while the rage of great crimes burns over shallow graves. There is a place in Chile where no one dares to look for vanishing, vanishing stars, a black hole in the heart of ordinary men. 
Um, <clears throat> that's a reference to the, I think it's called the Southern Observatory in Chile, or bizarrely, it might even be the Northern Observatory in Chile. I'm not sure which. And now I'm going to read a couple of poems f about this man, Joe Heaney. They were actually originally written, um, they were in fact commissioned um, for a television program about him. And I'll just read, well, I'll just read one um, called Gesh and the notion of being Fuyasa under um, an enchantment um, is to music or to, to music really, I suppose. Uh, is, is what I'm using here, the idea of the muse, but the muse in the Irish sense, <laughs> as somebody in a way, the notion, if there's an old story about Jirma Douglas Grania, and most people think it's a wonderful love story, it's one of the great Irish love stories it is, but the only reason he goes off with her is because he's under an enchantment and he can't run away. He's stuck. But this is about Joe Heaney, who was, I think, under an enchantment to the muse in some way. <coughs> uh, who ended, who uh, taught at the University of Seattle, by the way, taught Chano singing, and his archive is there, in fact. I marked him young and waited while he tended his book learning. I watched him dig and grow strong. Soon he could plain and polish a song he breathed deep and learned rhythm, rowing corrocks in the carn of sun. He was a singer and the son of singers. I let him play and led him to the well. When his wild days were over, I saw him drink with a bog thirst, a thousand songs. Oh, he was fine, my young king of the sky. London, Newport, Philadelphia, New York. The path was laid out. All he had to do was sing. His face became the perfect mask for spirits older than a priest's blessing to speak to when he sang, no other woman had a chance. In return, I put the burn of a turf fire, the swish of a girl's bright skirt, the ring of a horseshoe on stone in his voice. In return, I was the woman with red hair watching his black eyes quench when the last note snagged in his throat. Um, there is a notion in Irish that there is always a gift price to be paid for the gift, whatever the price might be. Uh, I think Joe Heaney had a, a an ending which for a singer is very difficult. He suffered from emphysema and it's um, particularly cruel, it seems to me, for a singer to have that condition. <clears throat> I'm going to now read a little rant. I might as well get it out of the way. Uh, you may have heard that our country has been in chasses again, uh, disgraced again, in trouble again. Um, we got very rich and then we got very poor, all within a couple of years. <clears throat> The, the upshot of this is the same as it always is. Uh, we lose a generation to the boat and the plane and wherever they can go. And I was in England as it happens when I finally heard the final fall um, and the uh, International Monetary uh, Fund moving in. And when that happens in a country, it's very interesting, in fact, because half of you thinks you don't care who moves in as long as it's not your own government messing things up any worse. And the other part slowly dawns on you that you really do have to tow somebody else's line now for quite a long time. <coughs> There's a very funny cartoon, by the way, I think it's in today's Irish Times by Martin Turner on this particular issue. Article 45, Section 4. I won't collude. I have a constitution. Four women and a man with a screwdriver could fix this with a mop, bucket, rags of dream and a game or two of cards, every jack, ace, queen on the table this time. We elected greed and you could say the dice were loaded, unload them. The well is dirty, the tabernacle empty, you burn the boats and exiled ghosts 
a tattered Amelian regiment wandering the world, muttering lies, old lies, and flittered lines from Bunrock na Herden and Am Alzheimer's. There's a time for metaphor, a time to ditch it, it's over. The ghosts are back in the rag and bone shop. Good night, bankers. Sleeves up, shoulder to the wheel, and shift it. Anger, my rage is chilled. I have a grandchild. What use is rage to him? Besides, he has his own small tragedies and those to come. His joys, a vote to come. Words flung into the wind for fun. I won't collude. He has a constitution and a right to it. This is my tattered ragtag nation and I love it. I have a republic. You fought for it once, then you disgraced it. Get off your whining knees and save it. I want to read a poem now in memory of my friend Bridget um, Hart, who lived in Paris, an Irish woman who lived in Paris and um, died far too young at home. She was quite beautiful and a really remarkable person. And she led me when I was in Paris to this particular place. And I just want to read this poem about that place, uh, called a church called Saint Gervais. And when I'm in Paris, I tend to haunt Notre Dame because I love it. I sort of use it as a second home because like all great cathedrals, it's a place where you can just hang out and people do hang out there. Um, whether you're, you know, praying or not, whatever you're up to. <clears throat> this is from a perfect V, which in many ways I sort of like to feel is partly responsible along with Joseph or in the guise of Joseph for getting me here tonight to Villanova and back to the Philadelphia area. Uh, the cover on the front of it is um, a Goya painting, and I discovered that it's not in the, or in El Greco painting, that it's not in the Prado where I thought and expected it to be, but in the Museum of Art in Philadelphia. And um, I always used to say, she'll bring me back here. So, she has. Uh, I want to just say now uh, how lovely it is to be here and how lucky I feel to have uh, come here as the Heimboldt Chair. Uh, I really want to thank Joseph for all his work, for inviting me, and the English department for hosting me, and Jim Murphy for all the work that went into this, and Kathy beforehand. Uh, everybody has made me so, we so welcome. I have to mention Emmer and Kathy, who have been absolutely fantastic, um, helping us do the shopping and showing us where to go and just about everything else. So people have been really welcoming and wonderful. Orison Saint Gervais. <clears throat> Praise the light. Praise the gold virgin, virgin, the icon of beautiful Christ. Rows of white robed nuns sing to his beauty. The girl in jeans sings. The man on the steps bows his head between sips. In Paris, every church is allowed its beggar. Praise the candle's gutter and the blaze of Babel tracing a gold finger, some say it cruder, into the night sky. Praise good coffee, white wine, dry as the bones in a nursery. Praise the cool air that seeps tonight into this cafe on Rue Muftar, where we talk of friends and what matters in the end, love, children, work, being alive now how the old gods emigrate, how they come back for a look. Cromdu will scatter the posers, the critics, the culture critics, critters, the government. We give Kavanaugh his moment and laugh. Beckett is inevitable. After the rant, the begats. Today I give praise for night. The choice of mosque or synagogue or mass the nun playing the bull fiddle before an altar. Call, answer. I went out for coffee and was brought to this vaulted church. 
a congregation drawn out of the city's capillaries sing the psalms. The songs are held in the ceiling's high curves like the canted limbs of lovers, moving to their body's most eloquent conclusion. Praise the word, when the splintered God will not visit, the word is gold. And I want to follow that with a poem, two poems actually for music poems. Uh, <clears throat> oddly enough, one of them is Tony McMahon playing, of all things, Raglan Road. Uh, unlikely tune for Tony McMahon to play, and I've only ever heard him play it once, but very beautifully and very sparsely, just picked it out very sparsely. And um, I think I may have the wrong book for this. Um, the other is a Jadanan poem for Alec Finn. So, from the Jadanan group. Oh yeah, okay. Ixian stopped, Tony McMahon plays Ixian, the great wheel of life. And just that moment in the music when you're listening to something and the music, everything just changes. That moment of negative capability, as it's called for poetry, uh, when everything seems to just stop and time changes and shifts. <clears throat> So Raglan Road is the great Patrick Kavanagh's poem, which is often sung. And every girl pregnant with disappointment and death is in it. The man on the rock saying, is ugnach of a fidden er an is in it. It is played on the rib cage, teased out of the bone nest of the tune with care, with skill, kept beating for the exact sessure a tired heart needs, then resumes. I have heard it fleshed out with lush curves, too much pigment in the tint, but this is the poem scored on bone, the tune given back to itself. The stops played this way once and only once. The air shivers, her own dark hair, a glint of copper, the snare, the sign that's known. Uh, that phrase in Irish is something that Marawakati, the poet Marawakati, said that the Irish language poet Martin Ziran from in Aran in uh, said to her once, it's lonesome to be a man on this hard rock. I think that was as confessional as it got. <laughs> You wouldn't want to get, give too much away. <laughs> the Jadalan Tapestries for Alec Finn at 60, um, and it mentions some of the great singers that were with Jadalan, um, Dolores Kane and Maura O'Connell, and poss I think specifically probably. Um, <clears throat> but also uh, Jadalan were, well, were known for bringing in a lot of innovations uh, of which um, certain musicians did not approve such as the mandolin, and there's a reference to that. It's kind of an in-joke, I suppose. Um, who would unstitch a tune from its haunting, unpick the cross-hatching of those instruments, silk from the fiddle, chain mail, a medieval slub, the bucks, the boys, the soloists' embroidery? Maura's voice darting silver between the musician's fingers, soda river, flowing against the stretched air, fiddle fast, steady drum, when time obeyed unholy orders, rintin, whistle, rantam, baron. Now the hunt is on for the king's own prey, rust-edged notes draw blood, Dolores. Stooped downstage, she threaded blue ribbons through the foreign innovations, and all agreed, sweet mandolin, they were continental occasions. You could hear a pin drop afterwards in slow motion and the feathery silence of the homing falcon. Um, Alec Finn was a falconer at one time, so that's where that is, <clears throat> why that's in there. 
And uh, I'll finish this section from the other books before I move to Valparaiso, which I'm going to read all of. No, I'm not. It's okay. <laughs> um, with a poem called, in fact, Hawk. And uh, it's about really uh, seeing a peregrine falcon out, if any of you know the west coast of Ireland, this was very close to Slinehead in a Corach, which is a very small boat in summer. And I had gone to a pilgrimage island, St. Caudian's Island. Um, my aunt, I hadn't been on the actual island since I was about 16. And my aunt was dying and I went on the pilgrimage for her. And she lived very close to there. And we were cl very close. We spotted him in Dunaval, knew him by the cloaked shoulders and how his presence rendered other birds unnecessary. Beauty on the wing, being this still gaze, being alive to his stillness, as if Christ-like he had chosen us as knowledge does. He chased a plover close to us, gave no sign that we were there, feet away in a curragh, shocked by the skill, the speed, how he fenced space. She fainted, pulled up sharp, terror fueled. Anything with a heart would have let her go. He fell back, vexed, and just when we thought he'd lost her, stabbed. Language can be like this. A fine spray of blood like a lacquered fan, then nothing. Still, I want him on my wrist. Would it be possible to ask for another tune, please, before I go on to the next bit? Thanks very much. Honig long of Alparezo, squid of chaid, shoal, sakuan. Cora hanam da magirna, reacht na grenya, tear na mua. Glusha she, a hurris father, yamas gamal so hio. Tafu class of garam andes, kahar scover, gle mashod. Now, these are the first two stanzas of a poem in Irish that anybody my age grew up with. And that music, whether we knew it or didn't know it, almost was one of the main background tunes to our lives. Um, the original poem Valparaiso, Valparaiso, uh, um, it's, it's, about a, it's one of the vision poems, like the song Spansel Hill. It's a vision about a vision ship, somebody stepping on it. This wonderful vision of Valparaiso. Um, and it was written originally as a Victorian, and my own view is not a terribly good poem, in English. A uh, Victorian type sort of writing, really. And uh, at its, not at its best. Uh, but then it was um, rendered into Irish, um, into a magnificent poem. And that, of course, is the one that survives. Um, and that's the one that we all know. And uh, so the word Valparaiso itself um, is almost a magical word for me, has always been a talismanic word, if you like, somewhere I might one day go, and still might one day go, actually. Maybe this book will get me there. Uh, it started, the center of the book really is um, 
I got myself, I managed, because I've been involved with uh, environmental work for many years, and I've been involved in things called Bog Week, which is a celebration of the bog, and perhaps more, more so uh, with whale and dolphin societies and um, work on the preservation of the ocean. My father, I should say, just to give you a little background, was a fisherman. Um, and my uncle was a blacksmith and also played the fiddle and my other uncle played the accordion. Neither of them would be considered good musicians by today's standard. Um, all the good musicians had gone to England and America <laughs> from our area. They really had. And, um, uh, but they played and they played at home and uh, it was enough. Um, and uh, so my the beginnings of any interest I had in poetry would have been Keolux Filiac, the notion that music and poetry went together. Um, I want to say how grateful I am to the two musicians for coming along tonight and making this for me a very special uh, evening. And for Joseph for organizing it again, to Joseph. Anyway, I was, I was invited, as a, I was at this Sea Week and I, I was reading one day and somebody from the Department of the Marine was there and they invited me onto the research ship, uh, the Celtic Explorer. Since I was that high, I've wanted to be a marine biologist or a mar working in the marine or a diver or anything that would just get me on a boat. Uh, I used to want to run a trawler, but I kind of figured out that wasn't going to happen early. And so I went. And uh, it, this poem, the long poem here that I'll finish with, actually began on the ship and it's the centre. But first, I'm going to read one or two uh, other poems. Um, I'm going to start with the myth of language um, because it has a sort of an American co connection in the sense that there is a legendary island called High Brazil and it's supposed to float somewhere out in the Atlantic and like Atlantis it appears and disappears handily enough. And different people have different notions of what this wonderful place might be and it's just one of those legendary places. But then I was listening to Radio Ngoethe one day and I heard somebody say that in Kerry somebody described it to them uh, a long, long time ago. And the description he realised was the one I'll give you here. Hi Brazil, as just the myth of language. And this is uh, probably in Dingle, the Irish speaking part of Kerry. In, um, High Brazil, as described in Kerry in the, 18th century, 90, in the 1890s, was a town with skyscrapers. The streets were lit and people went everywhere by tram. Of course there was water, and like all such visionary places, it floated in on the imagination, its dimensions many. It glowed, above all else, with electricity, and remained docked just out of sight but close enough to reappear when the dark was too much to bear or someone got drunk and wouldn't shut up. You could taste the sweet smell of dresses, shiny, full-skirted, that turned all the girls into dolls. There were tunes, naturally, and dancing. A fiddle playing music lonesome for the unlit roads of Dunchuin, full of misery and faith and then a slide and the boys winking like brigands, said the old people, oh yes, out there beyond the horizon, glowing like the Titanic. And so their description of it was New York, really, or Boston, which I thought was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of sort of... Um, semi-religious poems here, but this is a little poem for the nuns. Uh, I went to the Mercy Nuns. <laughs> uh, and it's very short, and it's just called Mercy. And the Latin text that we had to do for our uh, leave insert, I suppose, was of all things about the Punic Wars, I think it was, the Roman Wars, the sort of a thing that a girl in the west of Ireland and a house full of nuns would know a lot about, basically. <laughs> <clears throat> so I just, um, there's a reference to that. We got, our, um, and, yeah, we got our Christianity from Egypt, not Rome, but the Pope won 
So all the convent girls sing, oh, 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 de bello, bello, gallico. It's a little in Latin joke. For those of you who had to study Latin. And this is um, about, it's called mystical things. And one of the things that I find fairly extraordinary is uh, there are several old Irish saints. And then I discover that Gandhi apparently was given to the same thing. And in order to test themselves, you know, after fasting and scourging, or Gandhi didn't do that, but, you know, generally mortifying the flesh anyway, they'd have to sleep between two virgins just to make sure. most extraordinary thing, I thought. And uh, uh, so anyway, there you go. This is poem sort of refers to that. Mystical things. And when I was, uh, this ages me, uh, when I was a young girl, you had to wear something still on your head going to mass, ish. It was just kind of on the way out. And we compromised between the, the, head, the awful headscarf and we, were, we wore these mantillas as if we were in Spain. Did, did they come in in America? <laughs> they were very big in Ireland. Everyone had a mantilla, usually two, actually. Ban T. Uh, sorry, what wrong poem? Wars and worse, mantillas, headscarves, male and female bicycles. Add churching, sex, mortal, venial, and reserved, and you have our miserable childhood in a sound bite though not four angels round my head, not the rose on the pillow, not the old dried blood on the wall. Is it different in India? At night, Gandhi had two virgins to test his purity. He was old then, dear old skin and bones. Two virgins, just like Saint Scrotius. For God's sake, why not whiskey and cake? <laughs> This is um, called Recession Eve. So in Ireland then we decided we were in recession and everybody had to save things. And so we had to do things cheaply the way many of us might have done them anyway. And, um, but they, they, everyone suddenly had to start knitting. Now, if there's one thing in this life, apart from minding hens, that I don't like doing is knitting. And, uh, Suddenly, everywhere, people were taking up knitting as if that was the, going to save the country. <laughs> that and having hens is the other thing that's going to save the Irish economy, just in case you're wondering. <clears throat> and I was forced to knit. <laughs> uh, not exactly in a sweatshop, because I was never good enough to be put into such a place <laughs> had they had them. But my, I come from a family of um, ten, seven girls. All of them were good knitters or sewers except me, so. And my mother was seriously good at both. Ban tea bags, grow your own oranges and chocolate. Divine the limestone for the best wine. Take up knitting and learn to stitch. Good luck, it's deadly dull. Though you could knit yourself a new man or assemble one quick enough from Chinese barbecue instructions with missing bits a leg sticking out like an elbow and wonky logic, just like the old maldiction. He would fix the roof, protect you from storms, and in an ideal world, while you knit a garden with a tree in blossom, unblock the drains. Then forgetting the heartache, the dropped stitches, you'd eat the apple out of his hand again and spin gold from the serpent's promises. And for, thank you for that lovely introduction, the two young women. Um, and I'll read two short uh, salmon poems. One is called, uh, well, sorry, the short salmon poem and one about a shark, a uh, basking shark. 
Ceterinus Maximus, if there is any um, cetaceous person here, they can tell me if I'm mispronouncing that, which I probably am. Uh, when I was a child, we used to always watch the basking shark. A, they have a beautiful movement in the water. Come in on fine evenings in summer. I bask, it's what I do. Food happens, scenery is provided, the nets are treacherous, monofilament hangings like algae. Beautiful though, they ghost along the floor, tumbleweed storms. I travel, the boats leave me alone, but sometimes for the hell of it, I flick my tw tail at a 28 footer just to see if I can still do it. The broken. F Did I do that? No. It's on. There was a bit of a pop. Sorry, everybody. No, it's yeah, no, okay. No. Well, I, it looks like I'll have to do my best Just without. Belt it out. Uh, sure. I'm not terribly good at belting, but I'll try. Oh, it's no yeah. point in looking at this thing. If it comes back, I'll, I'll come back very loud, probably. Um, can anybody at all hear me? <laughs> Caged, liverish, stressed, drugged out, unsure, as students sapped of defiance, they wait to be picked from the water. Their fins and tails are webbed from where they beat against the cage, wearing themselves down. Force-fed, they bloat, sea lice feast on them. Without the pink dye they are given, we would gag at the sight of their flesh on a plate. We know salmon tasted like knowledge, but it burned your thumb, marked you for life, the smallest lick of the real thing, and hunger for it. And sea road, no map. Are we back in business? We Thanks, ran out Joseph. of batteries. Oh. <laughs> Like, what was it that ran out of batteries recently that was severely important? Oh, an aeroplane. Wasn't it a battery fall or something like that? I'm terrified of flying, and that didn't help one bit. Sea road, no map. So when you're in a ship, you feel, well, I feel anyway, incredibly well looked after and safe. Um, uh, it's a bit like, I suppose, I imagine it would be in a convent or a monastery. Um, where there's a very strict routine, there's no drink, and um, you have your little cell, really, your cabin. I said to you, I will die if I stay, and you said, Jesus will die anyway. You spoke as if I did not exist. What world would have me a ship? She moves me on from impossible Ireland, the rack of ties I have knotted too tightly, things I do not understand like gardens, sisters, why days taste flat, we slide out the bay, past Salt Hill, leaving Galway rampant, the drug dealers, the scrap merchants, a city at the races, every horse wild-eyed, the merchant class, handing one another rosettes, flanked, heaving at how well we are all doing under the lash, under the last arch. Three musketeers raise their cans to another new hotel. How many new hotels can the homeless need? The Buckfast kids under the bridge will start no revolution. The guns are moving in another direction and gunmen have to make a living somehow. Cliffs, birds, Blaskets slip by. I think, can we keep on going to Valparaiso and never come back? Surely it will be easy in Valparaiso with oranges and tin hearts and only one kind of fruit and no voice following with one half of a conversation. It was making day when I looked out 
at the kind of beauty that leaves death unthinkable. Purple slate, gannets rising in small explosions, and everything makes sense. The world is round again, and we are its sun, describing a horizon. Ratskin waves stretch to America, lumps of sea rise to the bow and below, acres of drowned Ireland and a mountain. The sea is streaming through him, his eyes dissolving in salt water, sting. Is this how the soul might know itself, fathoming, like two saints meeting on the way from Rome, one saying this is a flowering plain, picking a bluebell and offering his proof archly, the other saying this is the sea, and scooping up a salmon in reply, fathoming deeper intentions, small treacheries, the slant pitch of the deck face forcing the centre inward, somewhere near the solar plexus. Today, he'd be fined for the sea's bounty. I am dissolving. What would sing in me is the deep ocean, the roll and pitch of her voice, the wrecks, fish, instruments, the drowned and those who swim in her. Land makes sense from this distance. We hear its jangled music like a score. We shift destination to nymph's banks. Dinophysis lures the scientists now inland, now offshore, now unexpectedly to the sea floor. Inside this small hub, all is domestic and office. Computers, phones, faxes, link us to land, to our houses, to the hand on the phone. There is no hand on the phone. In the hall in Donegal, a kitchen in Donegal, a living room in Brest. We wash our cups and make snacks and watch the progress of the deluge in England. The washing machine hums, someone coughs. Helena is working out in the gym. Miles away, Ireland is rich in tribunal and gridlock. Oceano Knox, taken from uh, a title of one of, Derek, one of my favorite poets, Derek Walcott's poem, great, wonderful poem, Oceano Knox. And um, uh, I'll just read a tiny uh, uh, quote from Walcott at the beginning. And I want to read this poem for um, <clears throat> my old friend pa Patricia Haberstrow and Patricia Boyle Haberstrow and a great Irish poet, poetry scholar, Irish studies scholar and literature scholar, and her husband Chuck, and uh, for my husband Steve, who has had to put up with me in this as well. Awake at four, the moon ahead, oh sorry, from Walcott. In the midst of the sea, there is a horned island with deep green harbors where Greek ships anchor. Awake at four, the moon, a headache, stabilizers rumbling, I know instantly where I am. Below us are old Greek instruments for calculating the influence of the stars. Now it is all geometry again. The nun's harsh voice is onan an karnog ar an tjorgon, first lessons in the sweet art of navigation. And everything, the stars measured light, the toxic red tide flown, snatched at, as in a dream pulsing with its own diurnal rhythm, what's drowned in the sea is buried in the cortex, an x-ray of all the lost possibilities, the things we know, bunches of violets silvering a line, and things we don't, the deadly runoff from a mine. The sea swings her skirt indifferently. A red tide gathers in a thin horizontal column her mate is the hard bed from which she is drawn. Creatures, fine as glass, ride her thermals, the caped dinoflagellates, swiveling jewels, the color of peridots, and dinophysis, the scientist's prey, red, handsome, bad. Ghost nets waltz across the bottom, fishing. They catch shark, whales, they snatch music from the dead, whose bones make perfect instruments. The sternal notch from a drowned soprano 
In life, her light, slight vibrato might have marred, marred Rusalka's aria, an ivory jew's harp from some rough sailor, the delicate want bone of an ex-nun. All night I hear them practicing in tune, a pale choir caught in monofilament, in the poison bright of nudibacks, sea slugs. The dull gleam of a chalice, by a faster than me, a cicalice, pie, or in the shrouded limbo of the pelagic, the abyssal water, where creatures with strange sexual habits reproduce, there are works buried in the mud. Antikythera, rare as the Mona Lisa, your wheels still court the stars, high, where we suppose God wove our need for him and one another into seven sacraments, and the greatest of these was absolution. O shriving God, dethroned by Freud, you have left us searching among the wrecks for old wine, a Spanish crucifix, measuring luminescence on a screen. I leave it there, it's not the end of the poem. Thank you very much for being such uh, an attentive audience, for coming at all and staying. And bids uh, maybe another tune. Thank you. Let me also say that there are books for sale outdoors um, any moment. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Remain Thank you. Yeah.